So thanks everyone for joining today. So today our speaker uh, is Cesare uh, Maloso. Uh, he's a PhD student at CISA. Um, and he's been working a lot on uh, DeepMD, training different types of deep neural network potentials for different systems, electrolytes, water. And I'd say the goal of this talk is really just to give a, more of a practical hands-on perspective of the things that he's, challenges that he's encountered, perhaps practical things, uh, uh, and it's less of a seminar really on uh, specific research that he's been working on. Uh, and I know there's a lot of common interests in all our different subgroups on machine learning and deep neural networks. So, Jezzer, the floor is yours. Yeah. So, hi. So today we're going to talk about uh, basically how to build, uh, how to craft uh, an accurate machine, machine learning potential for uh, atomistic simulation. So I will start uh, with uh, a very, very small theore theoretical intro introduction and then uh, I will uh, pro provide you also some examples, uh, input files, uh, how to deal with uh, training the model, testing the model, and uh, using the model, so it will be very pra pra practical. So let's start. Let's start from the very big beginning. Uh, everyone here is uh, familiar with the molecular dynamics sim simulations, and uh, basically, and these simulations allows us to uh, perform uh, experiments in our uh, computer. And uh, this is uh, possible solving the equation of motion and uh, following the, dy the, dy the dynamics of our system and thanks to uh, statistical mechanics then compute uh, a lot of properties then eventually can be compared with the experiment. But the uh, reliability of this result relies a lot on the quality of the forces that we are uh, that we are uh, computing, and of course the forces uh, depends on the quality of the so-called potential energy surface, that is uh, basically the interatomic energy, and that uh, provide the, the forces upon uh, differentiation with uh, respect to the atomic positions. So it is essential to have uh, uh, an accurate uh, pot pot potential energy surface in order to uh, to provide uh, re reliable results. So, um, there are, I mean, uh, in the last decades, uh, uh, there has been uh, basically two big approaches in order to deal with the computation of this uh, potential energy surface. Basically, there is the ab initio approach where the potential energy surface is computed from first principles. So, basically, you uh, solve the um, electronic Schrodinger equation and uh, the forces acting on the atoms are uh, uh, computed on time from uh, the quantum mechanical ground, ground state of the system. Uh, this approach has the advantage of being uh, almost para 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 parameter free, so we just need the atomic species and the atomic coordinates as uh, input it is uh, uh, highly transferable in the sense that uh, um, within the, lab, the level of, of theory in which we are working, uh, we have no limitation in the uh, conditions such as temperature and pressure uh, in which we are working on. So let's, let's say um, an ab initio simulation of liquid, of liquid water uh, at uh, um, ambient at, at, at ambient condition is consistent with another sim simulation at high pressure and high temper temperature. And uh, uh, another thing is that uh, this uh, kind of approach is accurate in uh, describing uh, um, the um, chemical bonds, so the formation and the uh, breaking of uh, chemical bonds. But uh, uh, the cost that you have to pay is that this approach is computational, very intensive, and this limit uh, the length of the simulation that you can uh, that you can perform. So you cannot go uh, really beyond the 100 picosecond simu simulations, and also the size of this of the system that is limited to hundreds 
of uh, atoms. On the other end, we have uh, force, force field molecular dynamics, where the potential energy surface is uh, modeled by mathematical models that uh, approximate the interatomic interaction. And uh, these uh, models are usually uh, based on experimental or uh, ab initio cal calculation. The advantage of this uh, approach is that it is computationally very efficient and uh, there are a lot of different force fields that are well uh, documented in the, lit in the, lit in the literature. Um, yeah, it, it, they are easy to interpret, but the main limitation it is that uh, they are, uh, there is a limited chemical accuracy, so you cannot uh, really describe uh, chemical bonds, uh, proton transfer, uh, electronic transfer, of course, and stuff like this. And also, uh, they are not so much transfer transfer transferable in the sense that, like, uh, um, a model uh, built for uh, performing in such uh, in some condition could not be able to perform well in other conditions, pressure and temperature conditions. So. Uh, between these two approaches, we can locate uh, the machine learning pot potential. So in the last decade, um, there, has, there has been a rise of the uh, machine learning te techniques and, uh, and approaches applied to atomistic simulations. And uh, basically, this kind of approach uh, um, try to to, to, to deliver an early quantum mechanics accuracy at a cost that is comparable almost to an empirical potential. Uh, there are a lot of different uh, uh, techniques. There are neural network pot potentials, there are gap, there are ACE, MACE, and there are really a lot of, a lot of different approaches. But let's say that uh, the, the common things that really allows this uh, te these, te these techniques uh, to really works is that uh, um, they have a very uh, flexible functional form that basically allow, allow, allow them to be uh, universal approximators and so to be um, to really well fit the potential energy surface. So where does this SNAP come from? I've never heard of SNAP. Well, this was, I think, some years ago. But I mean, this is just a list of different stuff. But I mean, the, the most important are neural, neural network, gap, of course. Then you have uh, kernel approaches, like uh, regression, stuff like this. And then you have this new, I mean, new ACE, MACE, and stuff like this by Gabor that are really, really powerful. So uh, among all these kind of techniques, here we will focus uh, on the deep potential method. So this method is uh, based on neural, on neural networks, and it was developed uh, uh, in, uh, Roberto, in Roberto Carr Group in Princeton almost six years ago. Uh, we start here with the assumption of this, of this method. So first, first of all, we assume that uh, the potential energy surface, that is a many body, uh, object that is a, a function of all the atomic uh, position can be split in a sum of, uh, let's say, short range many body atomic contribution phi i. So this is uh, a sum that run on the atoms and these are our short range contrib contrib contribution that depends on the local environment, this ri represents the local environment of the atom i. So in this way, one is able to, to split uh, a many-body object to a sum of short-ranged many-body steel object. Uh, another assumption is that this phi i uh, has to be continuous and different, different, differentiable uh, in order to not have problem with, um, with the forces. So uh, it is important that these are smooth object in order to have meaningful uh, forces. Then uh, we want this object to 
have the same symmetry symmetries of the environment, so to be translational, rotational, and, pre and permutational invariant. And uh, lastly, uh, these phi i are represented by a deep neural, neural network train on the FT data. So these are, basic, are, the, are the basic assumption of this uh, approach. Now, let's, let's dig a bit uh, deeper and let's introduce the, the descriptor that is the let's say, the main ingredient of uh, uh, all these kind of uh, te techniques. So we said that the potential energy <coughs> surface can be split in local contribution, and this uh, local contrib contribution are a function of uh, the local environment of each atom that is uh, represented here by Ri, that is uh, the local descriptor of the atom I, and we can uh, at, at the first uh, write it as uh, the matrix uh, containing uh, the position of uh, all the atoms inside this uh, local uh, environment. So there will be a certain number of atoms, in this case an, an I, and uh, this matrix contains all the positions. So let's uh, consider our system. Let's look at the atom I, the one in green, and in order to define a uh, a uh, local environment, the easiest thing to, to do is to introduce a cutoff radius and then to say that uh, all the atoms within this cutoff are the atoms in this local envir en environment. So uh, we, we move from our, our matrix with the absolute coordinates to a matrix with the relative coordinates with respect to the position of the atom I, and uh, in this way we ensure the descriptor to have uh, um, a translational uh, symmetry that we, we have to, re to, requi to require. Then, uh, uh, since we intro introduce a cutoff, uh, we are introducing a, discon a discontinuity in the energy here, so we, in we introduce also a smoothing function that basically uh, weights uh, in different ways uh, the entries uh, of this um, matrix. Uh, the function basically requires another cutoff that is called, uh, that is a shorter cutoff, and uh, for the atom inside this short cutoff, uh, the weights uh, is uh, one over the distance between the atom and the atom I, while uh, between the two cutoff. Uh, the weight uh, is modulated, let's say, I mean, the, yeah, the weight is mod modulated by a cosine, and then uh, beyond the, cu the cutoff, the, the weight is uh, zero, so we are not including the atom uh, beyond the cutoff. So the new descriptor... So is there any motivation for the cosine modulation? No, no, actually, no, I, I mean, you want something to be smooth, uh, now I saw that probably in the last version they used uh, some polynomial thing, uh, so I don't know when they, they, they change it, but they actually change, 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 change it, but you just want something to be small and to go to zero. This is what you want. Because if you do not have something that goes to zero, then you would have pro problem when you compute derivative here. So uh, you want something and the forces. So you want something to be smooth. <coughs> so uh, we define a new descriptor, R tilde, that, uh, uh, that has both ra radial and uh, an angular uh, part, uh, and uh, that is now weighted with this uh, smoothing function. So the first column is just a radial part, while the other, uh, the other column contains the angular informations. Of the, um, of the position of the local environment of the atom. I. So now, uh, let's talk about a bit about sym symmetry. So there are basically two ways in order to, um, to force, no, not to, to force, but to allow our, our, uh, our uh, function to have the correct uh, symmetries, and basically the the, most br the more brutal one would be just to let the neural network learn those uh, symmetries. 
but that would be a cumbersome task because, I mean, you would have to provide to the neural network a huge amount of data in order to let it learn this kind of symmetries. While it is, let's say, simpler to have a descriptor that already is invariant under those symmetries. So let's start from our R tilde, and uh, R tilde is already transla translational invariant, so okay. Now um, let's look at R tilde times R tilde transpose, <coughs> and this is basically rotational and translational invariant. Um, just do the math and you will find, find out easily that it is like this. And now for the permutational uh, symmetries, it, I mean, things start to get a bit crazy because um, you, basic, you, basically, uh, you basically exploit a deep neural, neural, neural network just to map your, uh, um, your matrix with the atomic coordinates to the, to the final uh, descriptor. So basically you start from this R tilde, you take just the radial part and you map it through an embedding matrix um, to an embedding matrix through an encoding neural network. So each of these scalars are mapped to M1 values. Then you exploit this GI and you built this uh, final descriptor di sandwiching basically your rotational and translational invariant descriptor with the, the wall gi on the left and on the right with just the first few column of uh, gi so this is very obscure i mean this is it it seems a bit like magic it is uh, easy to show that this uh, is uh, rotational, permutational, and translational invariance. But, but basically what you are uh, doing is, with, the, with this GI, you are projecting your initial desk descriptor in a space that uh, uh, preserved the symmetries that you are requiring. And, that, and basically, um, it is not so far from the SOP expansion when it, where you basically expand on a, Gaussian, on, a, on a Gaussian base. Here you are basically expanding on a base made of neural, of neural network. So I know that this is a bit hard to, di to digest, but uh, you do not need to really understand <laughs> <laughs> like everything yes, because I mean, it is just cooking recipes, but still. Uh, before so, you said that to load the similar pieces in the neural network would be very expensive, but here you're using the neural network for the permutation uh, so... Yeah, yeah, but uh, I, mean, the per, the per, I mean, this uh, encoding network is not learning. I mean, uh, uh, for the permutational invariance, you actually exploit, uh, exploit uh, summation because you are doing metric matrix matrix co uh, multiplication so if you if you swap two indexes it uh, turns out that uh, i mean you are not learning here symmetries you are uh, imposing symmetries with this kind of uh, construct construction uh, if you look at the paper here uh, in the supplementary inform information they show that uh, swapping or uh, uh, two indexes uh, does anything to the descriptor, so it is really a mathematical thing. So in the, the neural network is defined one for all. Your, I mean, uh, it, it does is, not depend on your system. No, it de it depends. Yes, uh, you have different uh, embedding metrics for different species also in the system. Yes, and uh, the weight of the of this neural network that is doing this uh, mapping are uh, optimized during the training so so yes basically this descriptor is also trained to capture the correct uh, feature of your system it is not only um, just uh, just built once for all so this is uh, this is an advantage 
uh, uh, because if you, if you think uh, of other methods like the Beller pari pari Parinello descriptor, there you have some uh, para parameter that you have to tune in the descriptor. Here, basically, you do not have a parameter to tune, you just have to decide the, the architecture of this embedding uh, network, but it is pretty standard. And then, uh, uh, during the training, this uh, map is, opti is optimized to capture the correct features. So, this is a powerful, a, 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 a powerful thing. So, so, um, so, if you had so, if one just used SOAP as yes. a descriptor at the beginning, yeah. it already has all these properties, all these symmetries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I just want to make sure I understand it. So, then you would not need to do this step. Which this, step? <clears throat> these steps of having a descriptor that preserves the symmetries. Yeah, yeah of course. So, and so, what, what's the idea? Uh, why not just start from a... From SOAP? Yeah. Um, There's so, some reason for this, right? Why? We... I think that uh, first of all, this is an end-to-end -end, uh, neural network architecture. Mm -hmm. So, from the input to the output, there is just one neural network. So, when you have to compute, uh, uh, when you have to compute uh, derivatives with uh, respect to the input, basically those are given for free. Because uh, everything it is already coded uh, via the back propagation algorithm, so this is actually a plus. And then uh, this is somehow uh, self-trained. I mean, this descriptor are self-trained to capture the correct uh, physics to reproduce uh, the correct forces, the correct energy. So. Uh, you do not have basically to tune anything. You do not have to to choose uh, uh, the, the n max, the l max, like in so. So it is a bit, so more, and maybe it is a bit more, so. yeah, a okay. bit, a bit more flexible okay. because uh, you are not limiting the structure of the descriptor so much. But uh, yeah, it is a highly non-interpretable this thing. So. I did not interpret. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but for soap, you also have. Sure. Yes. Right? Yes. So it's, it's an analytic it's uh, you yeah. have to code them. Yeah, it is. Okay. But I guess there, there are many, I guess many more hyperparameters. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. 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 This, this is, is yeah. Yeah. probably more, more okay. flex, flexibility. Yeah. I guess in the reason why they didn't use the software is that the software is very slow. You cannot do as many to do. Now you have to use the metric solution. Okay. So it's more faster. I mean, it's easier to say. Okay. Okay. And how big is this neural network? Uh, uh, this that performed embedding uh, usually you use uh, three three layers, and uh, the first layer is something like it is something like twenty five neurons, twenty five neurons, twenty five uh, neurons, or one hundred maybe, but. Something like that, yes. Uh, yes, so you end up basically with a descriptor that is uh, that has uh, 1,000 entries, something like that, yes. Okay, so basically, um, so you start from your system, you have your uh, matrix with the, all the coordinate, you build uh, the local environment matrix, you map it to these uh, local descriptors and then you feed them into a deep neural network. Sorry, when you say a thousand enters means for each atom you have a thousand numbers that describe the environment. Yes. Right? Okay. Uh, okay, so you feed them into a neural network that is trained in order to uh, provide you the local energies of each atom that uh, then will sum to the total DFT in uh, DFT energy. Yes. Sorry, one more question. Can you go back? Uh, so, uh, so you have a cut or, or you don't have a cutoff. You have a switching function. Uh, you have a cutoff. Yes. You do have a cutoff. Yes, and also switch a switching function that uh, goes smooth to zero at the cutoff. Right, but there's going to be a different number of 
atoms within the cutoff at any time step, right? Yeah, 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 no problem. So you just add zero. You just add zero in the here. Here you just add zero. I mean. But, the, but how do you know the size of um, cursive R? Is that do you have to take that to be like the number of rows? Is that the total system size? Or? Yeah, no, no, no. It is uh, uh, the maximum number of neighbor that you expect. Inside. That you expect. Yeah. So you have to overestimate, I guess. Yeah, you can look at your data set and see which is the, the maximum number of neighbor that you have, and then uh, you take uh, a bit more, maybe something like this. You can uh, you can you can start from an ab initio molecular dynamics simulation and you look at the G of R. So it is the size of the descriptor, and uh, yeah, uh, the, the also the speed of the of the neural network depends on the on the size of the descriptor. So that you have to not take over estimating that out. I see. Okay. Okay, so uh, we were saying that our neural network is trained to provide the, tot the total energy uh, as the sum of these uh, local atomic energies, and then one from the total energy can compute the forces, that is basically the, the derivatives of this with respect to the input, and it is basically given for free by TensorFlow. And that's so all, the, neura the neural network is giving us energy, forces, and eventually also the virial that is uh, important for uh, MPT simulation where, where we want to control uh, pressure. So, uh, in, order to, uh, in order to have an object that is able to predict uh, the thing that we, that we want, we have to optimize the, the huge number of, uh, para, of parameters that uh, enter the neural, the neural network, and uh, you basically do it minimizing uh, uh, the loss uh, function <laughs> that uh, uh, measure uh, the errors between your uh, neural network, so uh, the difference, the mean square differences between the energies predicted and the ground and the ground through, and then we have the forces, and then we have also the virial in this loss function. We have also some pre, some prefactor that can be tuned, and basically uh, they are used first to have a, a, um, uh, to to get rid of the, dimension, of the dimensionality of these things and also to give more weight maybe to the energies or maybe to the, to the forces. Usually what you do is you start your training with an, an, uh, a high weight, so a high uh, prefactor on the forces because uh, forces acts like uh, what it is called in machine learning uh, uh, a regularization because you are training on the on the derivatives and so you are avoiding uh, overfitting because uh, training on the on the on the derivatives uh, ensures I mean ensures uh, limit you to to face over overfitting because I mean this is pretty easy to to understand. But basically, so let's say that we have this data, and uh, I don't know, this is the ground, the ground truth. So uh, let's say that uh, so this is a bad fit, and we know, we know, we know it by by um, computing the loss, the loss function. Uh, this is. Uh, a good, a good fit, but this is, can also, this also on these points will uh, give us a small loss, but training on the, on the derivative, so imposing values here. This was here. Alleviates this uh, overfitting. So it is, uh, this is a very, very, factor and also the fact that we have so many forces with respect to the energies 
uh, alleviates this because we have usually two order of, param of, of, param uh, two order of magnitude of uh, forces more than, uh, than energies. So, uh, yes, the training is performed minimizing this uh, and the weights are updated with the stochastic gradient uh, descent. So uh, you are not computing the loss on the whole data set because that would be, would, be, would be a big effort. So you basically randomly select uh, some, some data and you compute the loss just on those. And, uh, and this also uh, helps the convergence, so uh, the reaching of the minimum of the loss uh, function. So uh, this was uh, the, let's say, the standard deep MD uh, method. Beside of the poten potential energy surface, uh, one can uh, model also other important properties of the system, such as uh, polarization and polar polar polarizability uh, within uh, this uh, te technology. So basically, Talking about polarizability, uh, here I, prov I provide you the example of water, of course, and uh, uh, what one can, can uh, write is that the polarizability is uh, the sum of the uh, position of the oxygen for our water system times the charge of the oxygen, that in this case is a 6 because we are dealing just with valence electrons. Then we have the position of the hydrogen times the charge of the hydrogens. And then we have, uh, we have the electronic charge that is uh, centered in the uh, center of the maximally localized Bagnet functions. So uh, let's take, for example, the uh, water molecules. Each water molecule has, uh, sorry, has uh, four Bagnet centers. Each of, each of them carries two electrons, and one can compute the average position of each of these uh, four uh, objects that is called Vanier centroids, and that it is the thing that enter the um, computation of the polar, polar, polarization here. Each Vanier centroid carries a charge of minus eight, and basically the position of this Vanier centroid is something that can be predicted by uh, a deep neural network trained not now on the, en on the energy, but uh, on the position of this Vanier centroid. So you basically sit on an, hydro an, an oxygen, you look at your environment, and the neural network is able to predict where is the Vanier centroid associated to this uh, uh, oxygen. Same story for the polarizability, so polarizability is the derivative of the polarization with respect to an infinitesimal electric field at fixed atomic coordinates and basically you can apply the same technology to predict the polarizability that it is a tensor now, so uh, it is a matrix basically. So, uh, which is the, sta the standard protocol? So you start from a data set that uh, someone gave you. Uh, this data set is made of uh, uh, frames of systems. So you have uh, ato the atomic species, you have the atomic coordinates, and you have the simulation box. Now you start uh, the, lab the labeling of this data set. So you choose your favorite DFT code, quantum espresso, and uh, you compute <laughs> energy. That's very politically correct. Right. <laughs> yeah, obviously. <laughs> and so for. There's also CP to K and all these other coins which are. I don't know. Equally good or better, maybe. <laughs> I actually had a more serious question going back. Yeah. So, so, the, 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 so you have a separate deep neural network. Yes. That now takes in your positions of the, of the nuclei yeah. and you predict the centroid position yes. only. Yes. That's what you get out of Yeah, yeah. This is, uh, I mean, 
instead of phi i, now we have uh, the position of the cent centroid. And uh, now going back to your, uh, your smooth continuous descriptor. The descriptor is, is the same. The descriptor is the same, doesn't change. Doesn't change. We have the same okay. descriptor. Wait, wait, wait. wait yeah, so sorry, wait, wait. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> the descriptor yeah. doesn't change. So, but, but what, what are you learning? You are learning the You are learning the distance between the oxygen and the Vanier centroid in this case. But your input data contains information about the entire local environment. Yeah, of course, because the position of the Vanier centroid depends on the entire local environment of each entity. But then, but then, sorry, no, no, no. but then the, so when you, if you go to the, the other slide, so this property, uh, no, maybe it's the previous one, sorry. No, yeah, this one. No, I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the one with the, yeah, exactly, this one. Um, each energy here is the energy of the local environment. Yes, of course. So when you are predicting the position of the centroid, what, what is the output there? It is a, a vector, it is not a scalar anymore, and uh, the output is the distance between uh, each oxygen and the Vanier centroid. Uh, it is the dipole, basically. This is the dipole of the water molecule. You can either train on this or either train on the on the dipole. It's just a matter of uh, of uh, let's say conversion. Does the loss function change? The loss function change in the sense that. Uh, of course, uh, you are not trained. I mean, the structure is the same. Just here, you have. Uh, I mean, instead of having, uh, of having energy forces and uh, virial, you just have uh, the mean square dis displacement between uh, uh, the true position and the and the predicted position. So it's basically the same. But does that not risk overfitting if you're, if you're fitting it only on the positions? Does that not risk overfitting? Yeah, you could, you could of course, but I mean there are ways to control overfitting, uh, having a validation set and stuff like this. But yes, of course, I mean in machine learning uh, you you always face uh, overfitting. Here uh, you do not face it very often because uh, you train a lot on the grade on the gradient, but still it would be, it would be possible also in this case. So and sorry, wait, hold on. Yeah. So um, back to the electrostatics. So what are you doing with this exactly? What's the point of having a polarization and polarizability? Oh, well, uh, compute the IR spectra. Okay. So this isn't. This is unrelated to dynamics. This is just. Uh, and uh, later we will show that this allow allows you to include the long range interactions. Okay. Uh, so. Yes, so we compute uh, the FT cal calculation on, on our initial data set and then uh, this uh, data set is used within the deep MD kit to train uh, the deep neural network that will uh, predict uh, forces, energy and area and then this neural network is taken as, uh, as a force field model uh, by lamps uh, to, uh, to, to do the real dynamics of our system. So, uh, now, well, I have some input to show you. I don't know if you are uh, interested in uh, have a look of the input, how do they look like, yeah. uh, yes. stuff like this. Uh, maybe, uh, yeah. before we move on, maybe uh, <laughs> this, this, um, what do you call it? Cut-off function, yeah. right? Uh, you, you have a, like a cubic polynomial now? Or? Yeah, 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 something okay. like that. So I think the reason may be twofold. One is that probably the polynomial is faster to calculate than the cosine. And the other one is that the cosine gives you a jump in the second derivative, which okay. you get rid of if you have a cubic okay. polynomial. So okay, yes, yes. So maybe uh, I could... Uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Yes. Also, uh, question. Um, how much training data do you typically need? Uh, it depends. It depends because uh, uh, it depends on uh, how big you want your model to be in the sense of 
you want um, a model that just uh, is able to uh, simulate liquid water or you want a model that is uh, able to simulate liquid water and then maybe super ionic water and maybe ice so it depends on how big is the phase space uh, is the diagram that you want to explore so it can range uh, from uh, 100 of snapshot to 10,000 uh, I mean to a lot yes so like the model that uh, uh, they developed for uh, water that uh, is uh, moved uh, from uh, on, I mean from ice to super ionic water ranging from uh, 0 to 50 gigapascal and to I think uh, 2000 kelvins has uh, uh, almost 40,000 snapshots so something like this but like model that I trained for liquid water so just ambient condition had uh, something like uh, 4,000 snapshots so it depends also on the complexity of what you are trying to learn because if it is uh, liquid or something or something like this usually it is easier and how large is it snapshot like how many molecules so uh, the molecule uh, usually it is not big because you are you have to compute the ft calculation on so usually you range uh, from uh, tens of atoms, so like 50 atoms, stuff like this, to 200, 300, stuff like this. So, so you see the addition of on this and the difference from this is the difference. Yeah, yeah, you could, uh, yes. Then uh, we, will, we will see how to basically build a data set uh, uh, limiting the use of Abilicio as much as we could. So maybe first... Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, the, going back to the cutoffs. <laughs> uh, because cutoffs are, you know, always a. Um, so if you have a, you have a bulk homogeneous system. Yeah. Okay. So I, I can sort of understand. I use the same RCS and R cut, but now I have a heterogeneous system. Yeah. Uh, you get away with using the same cutoffs for all. No, no, you can change it. I mean, and you change you, it. How? Yeah, the cutoff values. So yes, every, you can so, so you I mean, have to come in and label your environments depending on what you think is. Let's say you want to do an interface. Yeah, yeah, of course. No, so no, you no, come in and say, "This is these are interface things. I choose a different cutoff then." Yeah. Ah. No, 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 this is not, it no, can't no, be, right? no, it can't be, actually. So, I mean, if you want to model bike uh, proper, I mean, bike system, then uh, probably your cutoff will be shorter than interfaces, I would say, because you have longer interaction there. But you have to, so you, you choose... You have to tune it. You have to tune it. Yeah, basically, I mean, there are standard for bike system that usually are six angstrom for this yes. big cutoff, and this seems to work almost every time and while for the short cutoff you use a 0 0.5 angstrom so it is pretty small because basically it is it is better to have a very smooth uh, descriptor than to have uh, um, I mean a big short cutoff and then everything that goes to zero yeah, very, very very fast so uh, this is what uh, the learning prefer so okay you so Car and people use six angstrom. Yeah, and 0 0.5. And 0 0.5. Yeah, for basically every material. And it's very smooth. I mean, it's it's a, the switching function is part of the potential at that point, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, sure. And somehow that that works <coughs> transferable also to let's say low temperature. Yes. 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 Do you have any intuition for why this is worse yeah. than okay. this yeah. Yeah. Uh, Well, uh, I think because uh, it's I mean, learning higher derivatives, it's, I mean, it's captured, it's captured by all the other local atomic Well, I guess uh, unless you have two. It's good effort, my guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But apparently not. No, well, I guess if you have uh, something, uh, an oxide uh, with truly long range forces, all this is, is problematic, right? Or do you, well, are you uh, able if to. You have, 
if you have things that are really sensitive to long-range interactions, such as uh, uh, such as uh, such as the electric so. properties of uh, water dimer. So you just uh, you just uh, follow the the, po the, po the potential energy of a dimer as a function of the distance. Then adding the long the long the long range uh, allows you to describe better the curve, of course. And, and yeah, because it's it. not screening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, because these are yes. a way of more than six times from your thing is. Uh, yeah, it is zero, not right? interactive. Yes, of course, but also the way, the, yeah. 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 I mean, so I remember they would capture uh, long range correlation if this is mediated by short range interactions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just remember there were these old studies from classical empirical potentials. Yes. Where when people were arguing that it was important to do E well to get so the long range electrostatics to get uh, things like diffusion constants. So but here you you're able to get diffusion constants without having the long range. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yes. So, yes, for the I'm just trying to understand what. Yeah. Uh, you mean for water? Yeah. You actually capture the long range interaction with the information. Because the long range actually doesn't get any sense, only the sum of the information. Yeah. 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 In, in some average way. It's, um, yeah, in some average way. That's yes. the point. Like, I mean, I mean, like yeah. the glucose. Of course, if you have a, I mean, a, a charge to verify where you start moving it, you don't have any. No, if you have just glucose. that, of course. Yeah, that, of course, yeah. Yes, that, of course. <laughs> so, just, just jump to long range interactions. <laughs> there, are, there are ways to include, I mean, the bigger. The biggest limitation of this kind of model is the short range. So there are ways to include this, and uh, basically uh, you add uh, the, electro the electrostatic energy of uh, spherical Gaussian charges located at the ionic and electronic centers, and then uh, you compute the electrostatic energy with uh, uh, in Fourier space with uh, the equal summation, basically. So. In this case, what you do is uh, uh, you have the total energy that is uh, that you write as a short range part and a long range part, where the short range is uh, the total minus the long range one. Then uh, you train a short range model on this uh, short range part uh, that is not the total energy but is the total energy minus the long, the long range that you are able to compute. And then you train uh, a deep Vanier model, so a model that is able to predict the Vanier centroid, and uh, with those Vanier centroid you compute the electrostatic interaction uh, centering uh, Gaussian on top of these Vanier centroids. So this is the way uh, in which you actually take into account uh, long, uh, long range uh, electrostatic. Uh, it has uh, a lot of limitation. You are not able to, with this, uh, with this technology, let's say, uh, you are not able, that is called the deep DPLR, so deep uh, long range. Uh, you are not able to describe uh, uh, electron transfer, and you are not able to, I mean, you, are, you, have, you are limited to have Vanier centroid that belong always to the same atom. So this is the main limitation. So for water, okay, since the Vanier centroid always belong to the same oxygen, but uh, as soon as you have uh, charge transfer or stuff, or stuff like this, you are not able to apply these uh, techniques anymore. So this is the main limitation. So is it that is it that it's inaccurate to apply for charge transfer? Does it not simulate charge transfer? No, 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 you can, you can. Uh, and, and you're training these two at the same time. Or so you know, first, what do you do first. So first, uh, I, I mean, let's say that you have a data set. So first, you train the deep Vanier model 
Ah, yeah, okay. Or maybe just a small data set, because usually uh, you do not need a lot of data to no, come yeah, out. Because to train the short range, you need to know what the electron is. Yeah, and okay. then you use the deep Vanier model to train the short, the short range. So you do not compute the Vanier cent centroid for with DFT for all the, tra the, tra the training set, but just for a small one, and then you let uh, you let your deep Vanier model to get, uh, to guess the Vanier centroid of uh, the other snapshot. So yes, now uh, just uh, uh, the last thing, and then we will move to tutorial. So uh, maybe it is a bit late. Okay, well, so uh, the hardest thing is building the data set, of course. So there are ways to, to make this easier. And uh, there is this software that is called DPGen that was developed uh, by the same group, so by the Robertus group. And basically the idea is this one. So you start from an initial data set that is small. Usually you take it from, I don't know, initial simulation or experimental data where uh, you relax structure, you perturb structure. So you start with a very, very small data set that can be 100 of snapshots. Then you basically train uh, a, dif a different number of models, let's, let's say four, uh, on the same data set, but with different uh, initial parameters. So the model will be equivalent, but they also be different because they start the training from different uh, weight configuration. And then uh, you so use sorry, weight meaning what? You... The weights of the neural network. Are the weights good? Yeah, they are usually. I mean, there are receipt to initialize uh, weights uh, at the start of the uh, training that uh, that helps convergence yeah. and. Uh, you just uh, change the this, this seed and you, you end up with uh, a number of equivalent models, but that they basically reach uh, different uh, minima in the landscape of the loss function. And since uh, these models are, are so much over param parameters, you end up to have a lot of equivalent minima in which you can end, and so you can obtain uh, equivalent model, but also different. So this model, you use, you use them to, um, to deliver molecular dynamics sim sim simulation. You use, let's, let's say, model one. And then uh, at, some, uh, as, at uh, some step, uh, you use the other model to compute an error indi indicator that basically measure how much uh, this model <coughs> deviates on that uh, precise uh, frame. So basically, if uh, this uh, error is uh, small, then it uh, means that this uh, four equivalent but different model agree on that, uh, on that uh, frame. And so this means that uh, in the initial data set, that frame was somehow already in. While uh, if uh, this error is, uh, let's say, within some range that is higher than uh, this low Threshold, threshold, then you choose it as a, as a candidate, you perform a initial cal calculation over it, you put it back uh, in your, uh, in, no, you put it in your initial data set, and uh, you train again all the, all the three models, and you continue this, uh, um, this procedure again, again, uh, Till you do not find any other candidate, and this means that uh, your data set uh, contains all the information to perform uh, molecular dynamics simulation with high accuracy at those temperature and pressure that you choose. So this is basically the, the way in which you, you do this. So uh, now, if, if we have time, I can go through some input. So, um, it does get slightly bigger to do. What? Just your, uh, not font. It is bigger. No, it's you can make it uh, the font larger. Ah, sorry. 
<laughs> okay. So I prepare you a few examples. I will upload them on GitHub so you can uh, you can you can still uh, input file. This is the the useful things usually. So I have a data set for a water model. I have uh, four directories. Each of these directories contains data. Uh, datas are in the raw format. So they are basically uh, plain text. Uh, wait, I will show. So basically, data. so let's take this one. So energy. So each row is uh, is an energy value, and each row is a frame. This uh, this applies for all the data. So also for the forces. The first row. Is, uh, so it contains all the forces. So this is uh, forces of atom of the first atom x y z, second atom x y z, third atom x y z, blah blah blah. So this is the format that you need. So you need uh, box coordinates, energy forces, and then you also have to give the network the type of atom that you are working with. So in this case we have uh, zero that stays in this case, but you can choose the, num the number that you want uh, for uh, oxygen. So we are we are telling it that the first uh, 64 I think values like for the forces or for the coordinates are oxygen atom because uh, there are uh, there is uh, a neural network for each species. So there is one neural network for the oxygen, one neural network for the hydrogen. Um, so yes, this take uh, this basically tell you the order of the data that you are. Uh, so this numbers are arbitrary. Like, it means that this species gives you one. It doesn't represent something. No, no, it doesn't represent. I mean, just numbers. I mean, you could also choose one, two, and five. I mean, it doesn't. Okay. So uh, this is the input. It is a JSON file. So type type map. First uh, atom that I'm giving is oxygen. Second is hydrogen. This is just for me because uh, the network doesn't uh, need to know that one is oxygen and the other is hydrogen. Descriptor now. So the descriptor type. This is the descriptor that I that I um, described you before. Um, there are other descriptors, you can mix descriptors, but this is basically the, the, the most famous one, I mean, the one that you, you usually use. There are one that just uh, consider uh, the angular, one that just have the radial part, but this is basically the, the best, let's, let's say. This is uh, what you were asking me, so the size of the descriptor. So in this case, the, the descriptor will be made of 46 entries for the oxygen and uh, 92, so the double for the hydrogen. <coughs> this is the smooth cutoff, the, the small cutoff, and this is the big in angstrom. This is the size of the embedding network, so 25, 50, 100, it is an encoding network. And this is the size of, uh, it, it is that M2 that I showed you before. So it is this object here. Wait, it is uh, this M2 here. It is the number of, it is called axis mu. And uh, so our descriptor will be at the end 100 times uh, 16. Uh, as a dimension, these are pretty standard numbers. I mean, you just uh, you don't you you don't need to care about this. The seed, so the inis, initialization param, para, parameter for the embedding network. Then you have the fitting network. So we have three layers. Each each one has uh, 230 and uh, yeah and 40 uh, neuron. Also, those are pretty standard things. You do, not have, you do not have to change them. Uh, you can try, but you will basically see that um, it is pretty solid in a big range of uh, different uh, architecture, let's, let's say. 
then you have the seed, so for the, for the initialization weights of this fitting network. Then uh, you can choose the learning rate, so basically how much you want your, uh, your uh, stochastic gradient descent to, to decrease the step. And uh, also these are pretty standard numbers, you don't have to move to change anything. Then these are the, the prefactor for the energy and the start one and then the ending one and same for the forces and same for the virial. As you see here you start with uh, a bigger weight on the, on the forces while a smaller on the, en on the energies and then you end with the same, uh, with the same value for both. You can also train on the virial but uh, usually you do not because uh, I think that the main problem is that usually a pressure takes uh, a lot of, uh, I mean you need a very big cutoff in order to have a converged pressure in DFT so usually you just uh, use energy and forces for training because they converge earlier and uh, basically the, 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 pre the pressure that you obtain is not converged, so you cannot use for the training. So you have, for your viscosity stuff, obviously you needed this? No, 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 no. But basically, so actually the off-diagonal element of the pressure tensor converges quickly as the forces, and quickly. Yeah. So I tried also to train only on the off-diagonal element, but I haven't found any differences. So yes. If you're, if, you're, if you're going to train on the period, then what is the order of magnitude you choose? Uh, usually it is uh, 100, so a bit smaller than the forces. So 100, and then you end with the one, 100 or 10, something like this. But you can, I mean, you can play. Then here you are feeding the data. So three, three different systems. Each one have uh, uh, different frames. Uh, the batch size, uh, this is automatically chosen, but usually you use, if you have uh, systems that are bigger than, uh, they say, 32 atoms, you can use batch, batch size equal to 1. Uh, so at each mini, Sorry, at each what, step, uh, what at is each, the batch size? What? The batch size. Uh, so if you go there, so the loss function is not computing, ah. is, is not computing on the whole data set. And uh, here you control uh, on how many frames you are computing this. And uh, this auto select it automatically, but basically if your system is bigger than 32, they say. So when you have more than 32 times three forces to train for each frame, then you do not need a lot of, uh, uh, no, more than one batch because you already have a lot of data in one frame. I mean, if you only train on energy, then training on one, uh, on just one number, I mean, that could be a bit a problem, but since you are training on, on forces, for each frame you have a lot of data. So this is the advantage. Then there is the, valid, the validation data uh, for uh, keeping track the, overfitting, the number of steps, and this usually goes from 1 million to 10 million, let's, let's say. So for smaller data set, uh, 1 million is good, so for 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 snapshot, 1 million is good. Uh, if you go up to 50,000 snapshot, <coughs> then you have to increase, of course, the number of, uh, the number of steps. So you start the training. The training is performed on GPUs, of course, and you have this uh, uh, file called iCurve that gives you the value of the loss function for the forces, for the energy, and stop, because here we do not have the virial inside. So uh, you can have a look at the loss function of the total loss function, and you can see that it is decreasing, nice. So you can have a look of the energy and uh, you won't see any kind of uh, overfitting. Also for the forces, no overfitting, good. 
everything seems converged. So we can freeze the model with this command that means, uh, okay, let's keep this weight that we, we, opt we optimized and let's use this model to predict now. We can test the model with this command. So basically you take some uh, unseen snapshot and you see the performance of, of your neural network. In this case, the performance are, uh, so for the energy per atom, we have uh, this error in electron volt, while for the forces, we have uh, uh, 3.85. So this is pretty standard. You usually, for water, find uh, errors that are smaller than 50 uh, milli electron volt per angstrom. Um, you can load this data and do this uh, scatter plot in order to see that uh, your data are basically centered on the, on the true one, both for the energy and both for the force. Be careful when you do the same for the virial because probably your DFT virial is not con converged, so probably your neural network will be more accurate than your uh, DFT calculation and so you will probably see an offset that is due to the fact that you weren't using enough, uh, uh, a big enough cutoff in your DFT calculation. So this is something that uh, you usually see. Okay, so this was the first training. Okay, now let's first go to how to use this. So I trained the four model for um, sodium chloride in water. Uh, those are four equivalent models and now I want to use, to use, to use them to perform uh, molecular dynamics. So I have to use LAMPS because this is the code that is uh, patched with uh, DeepM, DeepMD. The input is very simple. You do not have to to define bonds, to define parameter, uh, weird parameter. I mean, those things that are really cra crazy, crazy. Because here you do not have to do anything. I mean, you just uh, you choose this pair style, deep and deep. You give uh, the, um, the model. In this case, I give him uh, four models because I want also to keep track of the deviation of these four models in order to see if my simulation is going uh, okay, or maybe it's going somewhere that uh, uh, I wasn't ex expecting to go. So um, this is a basic. So it, it's, it's doing this does uh, four independent MDs. No, no, no. This 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 will do one uh, and this simulation with the first model. Yeah. And then we'll use the other uh, three models. Uh, every 100 step to compute the deviation and print, and print it in the MD I dot out. I so then I can basically have a look at it. So this is... Uh, okay. So this is this MD dot out. So I have the deviation on the energy. Blah, blah. and then the max deviation on the forces, the minimum deviation on the forces and the average. So I can have a look and I can see that basically uh, the error here of the training uh, probably was something like 0 0.04, 0 0.05. So uh, the, neural, the neural network, uh, the models do not uh, deviate a lot. Maybe these data are a, bit, uh, are a bit out. So what I, what I could do, would be to take this and uh, per perform DFT on them and put them back in the... And then you retrain. Yes, so this was a simulation at uh, ambient conditions. Now I also tried a simulation at uh, very high temperature and stuff, and stuff like this to see if the model was still able to, to perform good. But uh, basically no, because just after four picoseconds you see that Very this deviation start. Yeah. Means compared to what you trained at, how high? Uh, this is uh, this was uh, eight hundred uh, uh, Kelvin. Okay. Yeah, I tried to. I mean, I I had I had to struggle a lot to make this fail. Actually, it was very robust. Uh, good. <laughs> yeah. but you mean you have but, to do uh, higher and higher temperatures? What sorry? You tried a lot to make it feel as 
it's very robust for See, for high, high temperature. Yeah, 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 for higher temperature. Yeah. Because usually when uh, you increase the temperature, then atoms start to be very, very close to each other. Your neural network start to predict a random number and system explode basically. So yes. So, so, your, so can you give me a number about performance? So how much time it takes to do this simulation per per core, say per core, per step, per particle? Okay, so I will give you the data. So uh, this is a water model. Wait. Of the performances. Right. For how many atoms? Yeah. These are uh, 200 atoms. So, where did you run the simulations? Where? Where did you run the simulations? Uh, Leonardo. GPUs. Because for me, I got one nanosecond for one million iron atoms. Where? No, Leonardo. How many? How many GPUs? What? But uh, how many GPUs? With, uh, with, with one node. With one node? Yes. How many? Four GPUs. Four. Four GPUs. Four. Okay, I will check your input. <laughs> <laughs> this is this are standard. Uh, Did you optimize it? So, with one million atom, you do how much? With the four GPUs. And how many steps, I mean, how many nanoseconds? I mean, almost a half. I mean, this sounds a bit weird because you expect uh, still this to be like 100 uh, slower than uh, force. Than force oh, uh, what's your time step? I mean, that doesn't matter. What do you mean it doesn't matter? Of course it matters. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's never one frame a second. Second. 0 0.2 femtosecond, I use. Yeah, so it is pretty the standard. Five. Well, of course, this GPU is not really filled with this filled with this uh, small system. So yeah, yeah, I'm far I'm far from saturating it, of course. So you expect to have uh, the same performance also for bigger system, but uh, don't know. Oh, no, I will check maybe later with you. Okay, so, but these are pretty standard. I mean, does anybody use this and find the. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Okay, so this was the input for the. Uh, do you use a compressed model? Yeah, compressed. Okay, then for a compressed, I can gain uh, a factor, a factor for. Yeah. So this can be you can compress the model. This means that you basically fit the model. Uh, you basically build uh, tables to fit to fit the model, and this uh, you can you can gain a speed up. You basically lose some accuracy, but usually not so much, and you can gain factor five or speed up. So the, the forces and energy are not great. Yeah. That's okay. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. So, uh, okay, now let's go uh, with the, this is an input for training uh, a deep Vanier model. So, for uh, predicting the Vanier cent centroids. So, same para parameters as before for the descriptors. Uh, the fitting net, uh, now it is, uh, the type is not NR. So not energy, but dipole. Cell type, this means to which atom you want to associate the Vanier centroid. So in this, in this case, uh, oxygen, because this is water and zero is oxygen. Uh, 100, 100, 100, the, the fitting net, so a bit smaller than uh, the previous one, because this is a bit simpler to learn. Uh, the loss function is different, it is tensor. 
and uh, that's all. And this is basically the same, and you end up with uh, the same, the same, let's say, model as before. No, 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 no. Uh, deep long range. Okay, this is a bit, uh, uh, I mean, a bit more tough. So the descriptor is the same as before. The fitting net is the same as before. Uh, minus this, that is the modifier that you have to introduce. So here you are telling that uh, you want to use a modifier to modify the 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 output that you want to fit, and uh, this is the type of modifier that, that you have to use, that is called the dipole charge. You have to give him uh, the model name of the Vanier Center's model, so he will use this model to compute the electrostatic interaction. He will put uh, a charge of minus 8 on this Vanier Centroid, so uh, it is correct and uh, it will put a, char a charge of 6 and 1 to the oxygen and to the hydrogens. This is uh, the mesh that you choose for the equal summation because you work in Fourier space and this is the spread of the Gaussian that you are putting on top of uh, the ions and the, and the electrons. It is the same spread, in this case 0.4 there is a rule, of, a rule of thumb in order to make the equal uh, to converge fast, that it is that uh, uh, equal to, uh, h times uh, equal to beta, so beta must be less equal to 0 0.4. Uh, okay, just to ensure <coughs> convergence in the computation of the ele electrostatics. And then uh, everything is the same as before. So uh, this is still straightforward if you do it for water, but can be hard for other. Okay, now this is very a nightmare, and it is the DP, DP gen. So basically, this software runs on your uh, laptop and uh, submit jobs everywhere you want. So basically, uh, the input. Uh, it's a bit long. I, I, don't, I don't know if you want me to explain it, but basically you start from an initial data set that is small, then you have to provide him some snapshot from which it will start molecular dynamics simulation that he will perform later. Then you have to provide him uh, the kind of uh, neural network you want to to use, so the, archi the, ar the architecture, and this is the same input as we seen before. Then you have uh, the parameter for tuning uh, the exploration part of this procedure, that is the molecular dynamics simulation, so you decide the time, the time step, you decide the, uh, the threshold for choosing the, can the candidates, and then you decide which part of the phase diagram you want to explore with this molecular dynamics simulation. So like in this case, for, uh, sod for uh, sodium chloride, I think, I started with the ambient uh, temperature and a few pressures, and PT simulations, a um, few steps, because it was just the first iteration, and this is basically providing me uh, these are already eight different conditions, and then uh, if, let's say, I give him, uh, let's say, ten uh, uh, initial uh, conditions, that it will start uh, 80 different simulations, from which it will bring all the candidates, and then it will eventually start the DFT calculation automatically, and uh, this is basically... And this is only automatic economist person? No, no, there are also other okay, codes. It is other codes. Yeah, yeah, also other codes, but here we use quantum espresso. And uh, yes, so this basically is, I mean, it takes a lot of time to, to write the input to start, because you also have to give him all the name of the machine that you want to use, the command, the partition, all this kind of stuff. So it is a bit of, I mean, it can, it can be a pain, but uh, then 
it will just follow the procedure here, so it will start to explore a very, very huge uh, phase space, uh, I mean, whatever pressure, temperature that you want, and it is basically automatic. So, this is very powerful, and uh, yes. Wait, so do they have a template for this, like on their website or something? Uh, no, but I don't know, probably yes. Uh, but I will upload everything on GitHub, so... No, but did you, did you have to type all these out? What do you... What did you, you make this yourself? Did you make it yourself? Uh, I don't remember, because this was... Uh, I mean, I took it from something that I did uh, years ago, and it were the early stages of this uh, DPGen. So I don't know if now things got better, probably yes, but... Uh, just because they have a, <laughs> they have an entry for your password. I hope they're not letting you save your password. No, 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 no. This is no, no. This is. I mean, That's insane. <laughs> this is just mine. I mean, I know this one. You. They shouldn't let you have that at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in order to log to the to the class exchange. Yeah, yeah. Of course, of yeah, course, yeah, yes, yeah. of course. This shouldn't even be an option. Yeah, but now with uh, Leonard, also with uh, Leonard, now you are not able to do this anymore because you have this that <laughs> new uh, authentication <laughs> thing. So can I do anything on Leonard? <laughs> <laughs> so this was uh, this was with Marconi chain that were the early, yeah. Was the, good old, the good old days. So. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> when so, you could run calculations without problems. <laughs> <laughs> Almost not really. Uh, so I think that was just what I wanted to to tell you. I will upload everything because I think that the most important thing that you will find from this is all the input. So yeah, this is basically it. Great. Thank you very much. Sir.